Introduced in 1971, P versus NP asked, can a set of problems that can be easily solved also be a set of problems that could be easily checked? Now, more than 50 years later, the world is still trying to solve it. 12 years ago, CACM premiered an article highlighting the theory's current day limitations. And while we continue to make dramatic progress in computing, the world asks, is it still possible? Join us as we speak with Lance Fortnell at Illinois Institute of Technology as we discuss 50 years of P versus NP and the possibility of the impossible. I was starting to write this new article, I was thinking I could just try to update, you know, what are the changes in the last um, dozen or so years since the last article appeared. But I realized, you know, not much has changed on the P and NP side. But I realized what has changed, what's changed is computing itself. And then I thought about, well, let's think about P versus NP in that new light. I mean, the, the problem hasn't changed, but the way we do computing has dramatically changed. And how does P versus NP, what does it mean in this new world? And I thought it would be an interesting, different way to look at the P versus NP problem. As described in the article, Fortnow writes how we are now heading towards a world he calls OptiLand due to today's rapid computational advancements. You start to realize that the power of tools like machine learning really are coming into play. A lot of the things that we would hope to do if P equals NP, we really could do today. Maybe P versus NP is not the barrier that we thought it to be, but actually a way to sort of think about what might be possible. While P equals NP has yet to be solved, the effect that humans have on computational problem solving has overwhelmingly changed. You start to see what I think is the um, death of expertise. I think expertise helps us get learning started, get us going in a, to learn a certain uh, domain, but at a certain point, the computer just kind of does it on its own. We don't use linguistics to do language translation. It's, it's done by examples, lots of examples, but the computer figures it out. While P versus NP began as a way to characterize difficult problems to solve computationally, we now view the problem as a way to chart the future possibilities for our field. The way you can kind of think of it is, you know, imagine a world of P equals NP. What kinds of problems can we solve? If P equals NP. How could we use that to say make big advances in health, for example? And normally we think of that as a barrier, but I, th I think the right thing to do is just let's not think of it as a barrier. Let's think about suppose we could do that and then let's apply tools like some of the optimization techniques we have, machine learning, if you can find the data or you can simulate the data, and then just try to do your best and solve them because maybe things we thought that were impossible to solve really seem to be we're making these breakthroughs. Whether or not P will ever be found to equal NP, the consensus remains. The future may still be limitless. I think it was really neat writing this article to see how P versus NP fits into this incredibly changing world we're in. It's a very exciting world. It's an amazing time. It's a scary time because we don't know what these things are going to do and where it's going to take us. Uh, but. I shouldn't be too scared. I think there's just a lot of excitement coming out. A lot of, a lot of neat things are going to happen. Um, uh, it's a, just a very, very amazing time. Find out more in 50 Years of P versus NP and the Possibility of the Impossible, a contributed article in the January 2022 Communications of the ACM.